Hey, what's going on guys? It's Andy the Mad Tatter and welcome back for part one of September's sales roundup. Uh, what we paid, what we sold and what we made. First of all though, I just want to get into a couple of little uh, thank yous for all of you wonderful, wonderful people out there. Um, channel's hit 500 subscribers now, um, which is so far, I, I say this a lot and it, it's true, it never really occurred to me that so many people would want to see my content and so many people would want to subscribe to my channel. If you'd have asked me at the beginning of this journey where I thought I'd be by this point, 500 views would probably have been uh, a reasonable expectation from, from my perspective. Uh, but I've actually got 500 subscribers on the channel now and just yesterday uh, ticked over 10,000 total views on my videos, which is just unbelievable. Um, certainly to me, you know, I'm just kind of a big daft knuckle dragger that kind of tells you about stuff that he buys and sells on eBay. And, uh, you know, it, it's a lot of videos where it's just cameras pointed at a laptop and all you really see is my hands. And, uh, yeah, I'm amazed that you guys tune in for all this uh, so much and, and whatever I'm doing that's, that's you know, so kind of um, watchable for you guys. I'm, I'm really glad I can do that. I'm really glad I can provide this sort of service because the channel's nothing without you, ultimately. Um, without you, this is just me prattling on in front of my own laptop, which is kind of something that I'd probably have done anyway. Um, the difference is I'm filming it now. And uh, yeah, you guys keep tuning in to watch it. So thank you so much. Um, I don't... I don't actively go out there and try to build this channel. Um, the YouTube channel, to me, is not something that I see as a source of revenue or as a source of income or anything like that. Even when it gets to the point where the channel you know, can, can ultimately get monetized or whatever, it's not going to be a massive focus for me. Um, my income is through reselling, um, be that on eBay or, or otherwise. Um, and the YouTube channel is just kind of a... I don't want to say a labour of love as such, because that kind of implies that it's some sort of hardship to do. Uh, it's not. I really enjoy doing it, uh, but it's just one of those things that I don't... You know, I, I have no aspirations to be famous. I have no aspirations to be a quote-unquote YouTuber, um, anything like that. So the fact is, the, the fact that you guys just keep tuning into me for, to my amateurish videos, and, uh, you know, I don't have, I, I'm not kind of a a massive personality or anything like that it's it's amazing to me and thank you so much from from the bottom of my heart you know if you can see me now i'm a i'm a six foot five 17 stone guy uh you know a bit of a knuckle dragger and i'm just kind of sat here and i'm almost gushing at the prospect of the fact that there's 500 and odd of you that have now sort of subscribed to the channel and had over 10,000 views is amazing to me guys and thank you so much so onwards and upwards from there uh, next, I just want to talk a little bit about postage and shipping, specifically how I post and ship my items. A um, couple of questions that have come up from viewers on previous videos just about this. So I'm going to explain how I ship and why. Um, again, and as always, nothing that I'm telling you here is to be taken as being the best way or the right way to do it. I never want to come across as though I'm telling you that it's my way or the highway, or that my way is the best way to do things. I'll tell you the way that works for me, and I'll tell you the reasons why I do the things that I do. If you then want to go away and try the things that I do, um, you're very welcome to. Uh, but if it doesn't work out for you, you have to accept that people people's experiences are all different. You know, you might go away and do the things that I do and smash it and do so much better than me. And in a way, I hope you do. You know, I, I want anybody who wants to do well as a reseller to be able to do well as a reseller because it's there for everybody. But anyway... Onto this with the shipping and postage. So I use the two suppliers that you see on the screen um, pretty much exclusively now, to be honest with you. There are a couple of rare exceptions. Uh, tends to generally be on things like heavy books and stuff like that where it's not something that's likely to get damaged too much in the post, uh, but it's heavier than Royal Mail would want to carry. So I, I do kind of sometimes use other couriers for, for different things, but by and large, I use Royal Mail and I use Parcel Force. And I'll tell you a few of the advantages of these services, and I'll tell you why I specifically use them. So all of the items that I sell, um, without exception, have uh, require a signature on receipt when they're sent. Now, I know a lot of people out there don't necessarily use recorded delivery, and again, that's your choice. Uh, the reason I use recorded delivery is simply because it cuts out the instance of, of people saying their items have never arrived. I have had, in my time reselling, I've had one item... Uh, that's that's been um, that I've been told hasn't arrived. Uh, that was sent via Royal Mail. 
I contacted Royal Mail about that item. It was a Rolls Razor. You might have remembered seeing it in some of my previous videos. Um, the I contacted Royal Mail about that item. They looked into it. They got back to me within about 48 hours of me getting in touch with them, saying, yeah, we've looked into this and the parcel is definitely lost. Um, they asked me for all of the details of the item and everything, which I provided to them. And uh, I had a check in the post within the week, pretty much then, or, or within a fortnight, certainly. Um, that's fortnight as in two weeks, the, the actual definition of fortnight, not, you know, hashtag fortnight. Um, lost my train of thought now. Yeah, so they, they sent me a check back quite quickly, um, paid me out, and I was able to refund the buyer straight away. So that experience as well uh, is another important reason why I use Royal Mail, because I have also had parcels go missing from other couriers uh, or I've had issues with parcels from other couriers. I've had a parcel go missing with Yodel uh, and that was a nightmare to try and get uh, to try and get any sort of uh, conclusion with. I've also had a parcel arrive damaged with Yodel which was even more of a nightmare to try and get uh, to, to, to try and get sorted because that involved a lot of back and forth between me and the buyer. Uh, who was an elderly lady as well, so she she was just about tech savvy enough to uh, buy things on eBay and, and deal with messages and stuff like that, but she wasn't totally uh, au fait with taking photographs on her phone and all of that business. So in that experience, I actually had to teach this lady how to use her phone and stuff pretty much as well over eBay messages to say, this is how to take a photo, this is how to attach it to the eBay message and how to send it to me, etc. Because Yodel were, they wanted things like photographs of the packaging that it arrived in and stuff like that. They were really awkward about all the things they wanted and then held out until the very last minute to actually pay out on it. They did ultimately pay out to their, you know, to, to their credit in that sense. Um, but the the process was more aggro to me than it was probably worth. So I. Um, opted out of just using their service to be honest with you uh, i've had similar experience with my hermes which is another big uk courier and I, I just don't i don't like using them i think a big part of the issue with these companies is that they employ a lot of people on um sort of self-employed gig based jobs so they're not really employing people who kind of care about being a delivery driver they're they employ people that want to make money um so and they're generally targeted by how many deliveries they do in a day so they're not so much interested in how much care they take they're just interested in how much they can get out uh what you find with the likes of royal mail and parcel force they're actually giving full-time jobs to people as couriers drivers post workers etc so they're actually employing people who care about their job a little bit more that's that's my opinion on it that's my kind of um sort of to Penneth on the subject and is not to sort of offend anybody that works for those companies or anything like that. You know, I, I think, say, fair play to you if you're working, but the company that you're working for are pretty terrible. Um, and that's not your fault, that's just them. Uh, yeah, so I'm not a big fan of some of these kind of new startup couriers in that sense. So I use Second Class Sign 4 with Royal Mail. Uh, that's a recorded delivery service. Uh, small parcel size that generally uh, costs £4 and it generally covers most things in uh, my inventory, to be honest with you. It'll cover anything up to 2 kilos and uh, with... I can't remember the dimensions off the top of my head for a small parcel, but you can Google Royal Mail small parcel and you'll get the uh, the information for the, the sort of criteria that that falls into. Uh, it also covers items of up to £40 in value. So in the case of the Rolls Razor there, I think that sold for about... For, with the postage and everything, it sold for about 40 quid. So I was able to actually get back everything uh, from that missing item sale uh, and, and refund the buyer and not be out of pocket myself. Because obviously it wasn't my fault. So um, that was, yeah, so it covers you up to £40 as well. Items like games, DVDs, uh, certain clothing items, if it's just t-shirts and stuff like that, uh, if you can fold them thin enough, they'll generally pass for a large letter, uh, and the large letter on second class sign for costs you anywhere between sort of £2 and £3 from memory. I think the most expensive large letter is £2.92 uh, by weight, and then the smallest large letter, I want to say, is about £2.3 by weight so yeah things like dvds and stuff like that they'll generally always go in that in that sort of category unless it's obviously a big collection uh 
Uh, special Delivery is one that I've used a couple of times as well. Now, Special Delivery gives uh, various levels of cover up to £2,500. So if you're selling high-end items, if you're selling you know, high-end audio equipment, uh, if you're selling jewellery, watches, things like that, uh, when I was in the jewellery trade, it was pretty much the industry standard delivery service for most kind of jewellery items when you're sending things back into you to workshops and stuff like that. Um, special Delivery is pretty much the, the industry standard thing there. They do a, a, a five hundred pound cover level, uh, a one thousand pound cover level, and then a two and a half thousand pound cover level, and it also guarantees delivery the next day before one o'clock. They do also do it before nine o'clock, uh, before nine a.m. service. So um, there's a couple of different things, a couple of different options with special delivery as well. It is not a cheap service by any means. Um, it is more expensive, obviously, than first class recorded mail, uh, but you're getting a more premium service. So it's very much that thing of you get what you pay for. Uh, any item over two kilos that falls out of Royal Mail's kind of standard carriage. So that's when I go to Parcel Force, which is a, a division of Royal Mail essentially, or they certainly were. I don't know if they got sold off uh, as a separate entity. But certainly from my knowledge uh, of Parcel Force, they were part of the post office, part of Royal Mail. So for any, any item over two kilos or unusually sized items as well. So you could have something that's less than two kilos but doesn't fall within the parameters of Royal Mail's uh, size guide. So again, this can go then with Parcel Force. Parcel Force 48, uh, that's the service I use. It guarantees delivery within 48 hours. It's not cheap as prices start at around £10. Um, but customer service and care with the carriage is more than worth it. I have not had a single issue with any parcel I've sent with Parcel Force in terms of either not arriving, in terms of um, you know difficulties for the buyer getting the item if they've been out when it's been delivered or anything like that. They're, they're a lot easier to kind of arrange a re-delivery uh, or go and pick it up or anything like that. Uh, and as I said before, they employ couriers they're not just kind of people that will drive a van for you so it's it's again it's that whole thing of you get what you pay for and if you if you want a premium service you pay a premium price uh what else would we saying about this now why can't i click forwards there we go uh notes on shipping still yeah uh buyers almost always pay an element of the postage yes absolutely i don't give free post on a lot of items anymore if i have something where there's a lot of competition uh, it's it's a big you know say say I had a copy of something like I don't know Call of Duty you know the the new Call of Duty Modern Warfare game on there or something like that I haven't but just for the sake of argument um, there would be so many other people on there selling that it would be a huge it would be something with a huge amount of competition behind it so in order to be competitive there you probably would have to give free post on it certain new items I'll give free post on because they are again high high competition areas. So sometimes giving that free postage can give you the edge without having to sort of shave too much off your actual asking price for the item. Um, if you need to stand out from the crowd as well, yeah, you, you know, and you don't want to compromise your asking price, free postage can give you the edge, definitely. But remember, you can earn the right to charge whatever you want. It depends on how much you want to put into listing an item. And I'm really into this way of thinking. It's a bit of a... I think certain people within kind of certain personalities in reselling and stuff like that, shall we say, probably don't like the likes of me coming out with this sort of uh, thing. And it's because it kind of challenges conventional wisdom and not everybody likes having their sort of preconceived ideas challenged. Uh, but I've always been about this, whether I've been working for other people, whether I've been working for myself, whether I've been selling cars, jewellery, uh, pet products, wh whatever I've been doing, I've always been about earning the right to ask or earning the right to upsell. Or er And what I mean by earning the right is how much you put into that transaction, how much you put into your listing description, how much you put into your photographs, how much you put into your research into your item. All of these things add value to your service over the next person who's just selling the same product but not giving any information about it. I'll give you a little example, actually, because this happened last night. I was researching a Technics uh, AV uh, FM receiver, part of a hi-fi separate system. And I was looking up... I'd already done the kind of technical research on it and stuff like that through Googling, so I was just looking online uh, on eBay at sold listings and completed listings for price ideas. And I pulled up one listing there, 
And effectively, what this listing said was uh, untested. Um, it didn't say it in these exact words, but it pretty much said, <clears throat> don't ask me any technical information about it because you can find it all on Google. And it's not coming with a power cord. And the I can't read. There, there was there were loads of things on there. Sort of the way this whole thing was worded just made me think: Do you ever sell anything? You know, because his price wasn't that cheap uh, compared to some of the others. There were cheaper cheaper sold items on there that had given more information and had a much more you know uh, a, a much more sort of nice listing. But I guess maybe it were done by private accounts or something like that. So they you know they're, they're not people that kind of play the eBay game all, all that often. So they might have had different reasons why their price wasn't as high. But certainly their listing description and what they put into their listing was so much better than what this next seller had put in there. And and you know this this other seller was a business and you know they they had quite a lot of transactions going on on eBay and stuff like that and uh, yeah they, uh, just just to be sort of saying yeah go and look it up to people that's not customer service that's that's not setting yourself apart and I think like in terms of me and building my brand my brand is very much customer service first and always will be and always has been so it's a case of come to me you can ask me any question you like about any of the products I've got on there if I don't know uh, or if anybody sort of around me doesn't know the specifics on that item, I will go and find out and then I'll get back to you and tell you because that's my job. That is my obligation as somebody who is a, a sort of retailer, customer service, uh, advisor, operator, business manager, whatever you want to call me these days, reseller, etc. So yeah, um, you can earn the right to charge whatever you want on an item or on your postage. It just depends how much you put into it. Also, sometimes if an item has a particularly good margin on it, I will charge part of the postage to the buyer and cover the rest myself. Uh, and this can avoid your postage looking too expensive while not leaving you as far out of pocket as it would if you were just offering free post on it. So it's a nice little compromise. So on something, for instance, like um, let, let's just take a, a, a big audio system as an example that would probably be around about sixteen ninety five to post with um, Parcel Force forty eight. If there were a lot of other sellers with that particular audio system on there, and I wanted to compete, I could do my postage at nine ninety five. Um, the buyer would then pay nine ninety five postage. I'd have to pay the sort of the, the six quid difference, and yeah, you know, we'd sort of meet in the middle. But that might make your listing more attractive than the next person's by just being that little bit cheaper on the postage. So there we go. That's my thoughts uh, briefly on postage. As I say, not to say that this is by any means the best way to do it or the right way to do it. And that's one of the great things about reselling. There are so many right ways to do things. Um, and yeah, I guess conversely, so many wrong ways to do things as well. But because there are so many different right ways to do things, you're always going to hit on something that works for you. So with all of that said, and me flicking backwards like a professional, uh, on to the things. 1st of September, ladies' Rab Micro Pull-On Polytech Fleece. Uh, Rab, another really high-quality outdoor brand. You know if you watch the videos on the channel before uh, that I really like my outdoor brands like Berghouse, North Face, uh, Rab, things like that. Rab are another one, um, very well-regarded within kind of the mountaineering and general sort of outdoor uh, hill-walking, fell-walking kind of pursuits. Um yeah, so this one was a just a, a little um, mid-layer fleece. It's quite a good idea that if you are going to be selling outdoor clothing and things like that, to understand things like the layering principle. Because uh, you can then sort of say, right, this garment is suitable as a base layer, a mid-layer, a shell layer, whatever. Um, go and research these things if that's what you're going to do, uh, if, if you're going to do these things, and, and just understand how... Uh, a sort of something like this, for instance, like this this um, this fleece, how it would fit into a normal uh, walkers or climbers, mountaineers, whatever, uh, how it would fit into their sort of normal layering system. You can quite often find a lot of this information on the company's own websites. You know, if you go onto Rab's website, you'll be able to find a lot of the information about how they recommend their garments being used. Um, so always look at things like that as well with outdoor garments and, and know what you're talking about because... Anybody can put a Berghaus coat or something like that online and say Berghaus coat 120 quid, but if you don't know your kind of, uh, 
you know if if you don't know your Gore-Tex from your AQ2 and things like that then you're going to you're going to have a rough time when people start asking you questions about it so uh, this one cost 149 this was an absolute steal in a charity shop and I could not believe for the life of me that it was only £1.49 when I picked it up that day. Uh, it sold for 29 94 now just to really quickly touch on this again, this selling price that I quote here, this is everything that the buyer paid. So it's the total price of the item which was 24 99 and the 4 95 postage on there. So this one is the full post, is, is the full amount that came in from the buyer. This profit figure here, 1939. Straight away, what will come off that 29.94 is the 4.95 that gets paid for the postage. Well, four pound that gets paid for the postage. So, when people sort of look at some of these figures, sometimes they say, "Oh, your profits are getting hit hard by postage and things like that." They're not getting hit as hard as you would think. Um, it might just be the way I'm presenting this information to you. Obviously, like I say, that's a total. So straight away, four pounds coming off that for the postage. So that make that brings that down to twenty five ninety four straight away, uh, and then obviously the fees and everything will come off that, and then that leaves with the nineteen thirty nine profit. It might not be again the right or best way to work things out, but it's the way I like to work things out because it just kind of it keeps me looking at all of the different numbers. Then it keeps me looking at how much I'm paying out on post. It keeps me looking at how much I'm charging, how much I'm paying in fees. It just keeps my head on the numbers to a certain extent. So yeah, again, and I've just put this little. This little explanation, I guess, uh, on the bottom of all of these so that you know it's the item price plus the postage charge. So I made 19.39 on that one. 2nd of September, uh, this was a new item. Uh, it was a charity shop pickup, but it was a brand new and sealed item. So uh, I always like things like that from charity shops because they're quite often really cheap and you can make a reasonable profit on them regardless really of what it is to a certain degree uh this was a ceramic mug in the shape of a camera lens um with a sort of rubber top and things like that i was able to find a stock image of it as well because it was just kind of as i say as a brand new item uh, i don't have any problem with using stock images at all on brand new stuff uh so this one cost two pounds sold for 25.94 and made 16.09 after shipping and fees there then we've got 3rd of September, this was a cracking buy, uh, I've actually got another one of these as well. This is a vintage 1970s, uh, 1980s, sort of late 70s, early 80s really, uh, Vatman 3 desk calculator. Um, these, I picked up two at a car boot for a pound each, uh, and the woman was a little bit surprised that I, when I said I'd take them both. They're both boxed, they've both got their instruction manuals, they've both got uh, the original sort of bag inside as well. They are used, they're both used calculators, but because they've been stored in their boxes and in their packaging for all of their life, um, they are absolutely immaculate. Uh, as you can see on the screen there, the case plastics and everything are still really white on them early plastics like this quite often yellow quite heavily uh, and can look a little bit nasty uh, but this is absolutely perfect the screen is so bright on it and everything as well um, it was just a real sort of time warp condition and I've put that in the uh, in, in the item description there as well in the item title uh, because it's it's as though you've just bought it brand new but today uh, the difference between this one and the other one that I've still got listed is that the other one that's still listed has its original instruction manual and this one has a photocopy. So this was a slightly cheaper, I charged a fiver less for this one than the one that's got the original uh, manual in it. So it cost a pound, uh, sold for 39 94 and made 28 69 after shipping and fees on that one. 4th of September... These were a couple of notebooks that uh, that Joe had lying around. As I've said a couple of times in my videos, my wife Joe, uh, she's selling up a load of stuff that she just doesn't use anymore. That she's kind of collected and hoarded over the years um, because she's starting some new projects using resin and things like that. So um, she she wants to kind of fund her projects. So she's she's selling a few bits and pieces that way. Uh, so these were a couple that she had lying around. Uh, they were brand new and completely unused. Uh, Peter Rabbit, Beatrix Potter note. <laughs> Beatrix Potter Peter Rabbit notebooks. Uh, there were two of them in two different designs, both designs that you can see on the screen there. Uh, and we did give, I think, uh, either a five or ten percent discount to the uh, to the buyer because they bought both of them. Uh, so this, the two of these, uh, with no cost price against them because they were something that Joe owned, uh, and they sold for fifteen thirty eight and made ten twenty after shipping and fees on those. Uh, 4th of September 2019, I think I mentioned this in passing in a previous video, uh, this is the Miffy Ceramic Plate and Spoon Box Set. Uh, I said in the previous video about this that I know about Miffy through my wife, uh, because she's into a lot of the kind of 
um, like your Hello Kitty, your Pusheen, your Rilakkuma, these these types of characters, uh, these types of sort of animated Japanese and Korean characters and things like that. So um, this was one that I was, even though Miffy's actually made by a Dutch guy, but he kind of still falls still falls into that same sort of. Um, yeah, that same sort of world of animation. There's there's a word there somewhere that I was looking for that's probably quite a fancy word, but I can't remember it. Uh, yeah, so this was a ceramic plate and spoon set, um, sort of designed as a christening gift, but could equally be collect, you know, a collector's thing to somebody who's uh, who's into the into the brand, into Miffy. Uh, this one cost two pounds, sold for twenty pounds ninety four, and made eleven seventy seven after shipping and fees. Um, and because I started waffling a little bit there, I just want to make sure I've made the point that I was actually trying to make. Uh, before, I found out about this character through my wife Jo, and as I was saying in previous videos, sometimes you don't have to be an expert in things if you know somebody who is. Uh, I was out just, I think I just nipped into a charity shop somewhere on the off chance while I was out doing something else. And uh, I saw this on the shelf and I thought, that's Miffy. And had I not thought, that's Miffy, I would have probably never looked at this because I wouldn't have seen this logo and thought anything of it. I'd have just thought, oh, it's some kid's christening gift or something like that. But because I knew it was Miffy, I thought, yeah, it's going to have some... There's going to be somebody out there that's more likely to want it than, say, some next unbranded christening gift. So, yeah, uh, sold for two... Uh, blah, 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 paid £2, sold for £20.94, made 11 77 after shipping and fees on that one. 4th of September again, uh, this is the Hobbs... Uh, merino wool coatigan, which is kind of a cardigan come coat with like a kimono sleeve and a little bit of a you know a little bit of a turtleneck there. It's a really nice piece. This I paid far too much money for it. I bought it about ooh, I want to say about six months ago. Uh, it was quite a while ago that I picked this up. Uh, not not a very early buy, but still while I was kind of still finding my feet with certain things. So I'd had some quite good successes with Hobbs stuff uh, prior to buying this. And I thought because this was Hobbs and because it was Merino wool and it was very nice and this and that and the other, um, I thought paying 20 quid for it, I would absolutely be quids in. It didn't lose money. Um, you know, it still made a, a bit of profit, but it's not been as lucrative as some of the other stuff. And that's just kind of because I got a little bit, uh, what's the word, a little bit blinkered towards the brand. And it's very easy to do this when you're just starting out. You have success with one thing and then you kind of, something in the back of your mind connects and says, well, everything from that brand or everything from th that's the same as that should do just as well. And it doesn't, it's not always the case. It really isn't. Um, yeah, if if you get into something like, you know, with in, in my personal sort of experience with Berghaus, let's just say, I'm fairly confident that anything... I got in, uh, if it was a Berghaus product, I would sell it eventually. No problem at all. Um, so I've never had this same sort of situation happen with something made by them. Uh, but what happened to me with Hobbs, I'd sold a couple of pairs of Hobbs shoes. I think I sold a Hobbs bag, maybe a Hobbs dress. Uh, and because I picked all of those up quite cheaply, I made good money on them. Uh, and because I'd made that good money on them, when I was out shopping again and saw this as a Hobbs item, that sort of made me think, ooh, Hobbs, ooh, 20 quid, must be worth quite a bit more than that. So it, I, I just kind of jumped the gun a little bit and, and had that moment of, yeah, just kind of... I guess it's a bit of greed, really, if, if, you, if we're being totally honest. It's that kind of thing of, I want to make profit on this item, I want to make as much as I can on this item, and if it's if the charity shop is selling it for 20 quid, it must have been about 100, it must have been about 200 quid new or something like that, and you just think, you know, your mind starts running away with you. You've got to kind of keep one foot on the ground at least sometimes. I don't, I'm not into keeping both feet on the ground at all times because if you don't take risks, you'll if you don't sort of take calculated risks, sometimes you'll never progress. But um, you've still got to kind of keep a little bit on planet Earth as well. I realise this video is almost at half an hour and I've only got to the fourth of September. Uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, positive feedback received from the buyer on that one. It cost nineteen ninety nine, sold for forty nine ninety four, and made seventeen sixty seven after shipping and fees there. Uh, 5th of September, this is another Rab item. Uh, this is a men's Inferno hooded jacket. This was a packable uh, sort of mid-layer mid kind of come transitional type jacket. 
Uh, this one cost eleven ninety nine, so not a bad price really to be paying for Rab stuff. Uh, you know, it is very expensive to buy new, so I was you know no issue. Didn't have the same issue with this as I had with the Hobbs coating them there. Um, so this one cost eleven ninety nine. Uh, sold on a best offer. Uh, for a total of fifty seven seventy nine, I actually had it up at seventy four ninety nine for the longest time, uh, and I was toying with dropping the prices here or there. And then somebody hit me with an offer, and I went. I think he hit me with fifty quid as an offer on it. I went back for fifty seven seventy nine just because it was an odd number, and I thought it might catch them slightly on the hop. Sure enough, it did. They accepted that, uh, so I made thirty two eighty nine after shipping and fees there on that one. 5th of September. Uh, this didn't actually sell on eBay. Uh, a friend of mine was round the house and I was just kind of tidying up some listings and stuff like that and he just looked, happened to look on my computer and then this was there and he says, oh, that's uh, is, is that one of them Ladro or Neo ones? He says, yeah, yeah. He says, oh, my mum collects that. How much do you want for it? So I had it on eBay at twenty six ninety nine, um, and I said, you give us 20 quid for it if you want. So I took it down off eBay and sold it to my mate, which is kind of... <laughs> Had somebody contacted me on eBay and said, will you sell this to me if I come round and give me cash? Absolutely not, because that's kind of going against eBay. I think probably doing what I did with this is a little bit going against eBay, but it's not quite so... Um... Yeah, there's, you know, they've never contacted me through eBay about it or anything like that, so it's not quite so bad, but it's not something that I like doing. Um, if, if something's going to sell... I'd rather it sold through eBay because just buyer protection, seller protection, things like that. Um, everybody has a little bit more uh, protection and kind of accountability through eBay. But because this was a mate as well, and I know his mum, I just thought, yeah, we'll we'll just do that deal. So that cost one ninety nine, sold for twenty pound cash, and made eighteen oh one uh on that one. Seventh of September, then uh, this was the Xbox three hundred and sixty Skylanders bundle. I this was one of the first things I bought. And I've sold quite a few things lately that I've built, bought very early on, so I'm glad to be seeing the back of some of them. Uh, I really kind of caught the fag end of uh, the Skylanders craze, um, and then they moved on to something else. Uh, I think it was Disney Infinity came out, and suddenly nobody was used, nobody was playing Skylanders anymore. Everybody went into Disney Infinity, and then sort of Nintendo Amiibos and things like that. Uh, so the Skylanders, by the time I bought these after hearing a lot of other resellers on YouTube and things like that that had done quite well with them. By the time I bought these, the trend had pretty much started to die off for them. Uh, so again, this speaks to the thing that I've said previously on other videos about listening to YouTubers. Uh, you can buy everything that every YouTuber tells you, but there's nothing to say you're going to have the same success or the same sort of failure that they do. By all means, go and listen to people. And, and get input from them and get advice from them, absolutely. But never set out to just kind of carbon copy what they do because there's no guarantee that it's going to work for you that way. Um, so, yeah, that includes me as well. You know, I, I'm by no means an oracle uh, or a sage in any way in what I'm telling you. I'm, I'm just telling you my experience on eBay. Yeah, I've had a lot of sales experience outside of eBay. Yeah, I've I've worked in a lot of, you know, reasonably sort of mid to upper tier jobs in, in retail and sales and management and things like that. But ultimately, we could both go out and buy the same thing tomorrow and you could do better with it than I would or I could do better with it than you would. There are too many factors to determine whether you can just go out and do the same thing that somebody else has done and make the same money as them. There are just too many other variables at play. So yeah, certainly take advice from other YouTubers, get information, but always apply that to your own situation and always kind of use it just as information, use it as advice. Don't go and make decisions based solely on these things because I've been there and done it and I've bought Skylanders as I've bought other things before because I've heard YouTubers at the time saying, oh yeah, this has sold really well for me and it's made this money, etc., etc." And then by the time I've got to it, no, no chance, nowhere near. So bear that in mind. Uh, Cost of five of this one sold for twenty five forty nine on a cent offer uh, on a best offer, uh, made twelve seventy four after shipping and fees. But so glad to see the back of that. I can't tell you. Uh, we're not moving again. What's going on? There we go. Eighth of September, uh, men's Oakley True Flip True Fit short sleeve shirt. 
Uh, I've said before on previous videos that I'll generally, with shirts, if I'm not sure about them, I'll always buy one that will fit me, so even if it doesn't sell, I've got a cheap shirt for myself. Uh, this one uh, was a really nice Oakley shirt, Oakley that's famous for obviously sort of sunglasses and um, skiing goggles, things like that, uh, and, and a generally a lot of sort of quote-unquote extreme sportswear or boardwear, things like that. Uh, this was a sort of soft-touch uh, shirt with a little metal logo on the pocket and stuff like that. It was really nicely done, actually. It was quite a nice shirt. Uh, cost me £2, sold for £23.94 and made 13 60 after shipping and fees. That one went on global shipping program to the USA. Uh, 9th of September, then, these are the men's super dry core light cargo pants. These were actually free. Uh, the charity shop that I bought them from at the time was having a three for two on clothing. Uh, so I, I managed to pick these up and with a couple of other items and they were free. So happy days on those. Uh, Super Dry, I've mentioned them in countless videos. Uh, Super Dry Japan are the English brand that have their clothes made in India. And uh, they're a nice sort of high street fashion brand that's that's generally relatively popular. They're quite famous for their coats and their hoodies and things like that. Um, they're not always something that you kind of smash it out of the park profit wise with but generally speaking it gets a lot of good attention to your store and things like that as well because there's, people are always looking for their stuff uh, item was free sold for 34.94 and made 24.74 after shipping and fees on that one and that went again on global shipping to the USA 10th of September uh, these are the men's diesel Zathan jeans or Zathan jeans uh, diesel are having a bit of a a fight back from my last couple of months where I've done well with Levi's. Uh, Diesel are fighting back again now. Uh, generally speaking, the two biggest brands of jeans that I sell are Levi's and Diesel. And uh, it seems that the last few months, after having a lot of Diesel jeans sell in the months prior, the last couple of months it's tipped the other way and gone to Levi. And uh, this month again, it's kind of seems like Diesel are making a little bit of a comeback. So I'm happy because they're all selling. So that's great. Uh, these cost three fifty. Uh, sold for forty seven ninety four. Uh, so that must have been an offer as well because that was forty nine ninety nine. I didn't put the best offer thingy on there. I've just noticed. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, forty nine uh, forty seven ninety four selling price on a best offer and made thirty two twenty eight after shipping and fees on those. 10th of September again, uh, this is the Xylis or Zillis salad dressing shaker bottle, uh, this was in a very early, or yeah, it was quite an early one actually, a uh, haul video of mine, where I was talking about buying retail arbitrage items, retail arbitrage being buying stock from high street stores and selling it for a profit, uh, when I was talking about buying retail arbitrage items, when you start dipping your toe into this, much like the same mentality as I take with shirts, where if it doesn't fit me, I can always... If it doesn't sell, I can always wear it, should I say. Um, with retail arbitrage stuff, sometimes it's worth buying things that you're going to use if they don't sell. So this was just a kind of uh, a bottle that you can make up salad dressings in and stuff like that, and, and you can kind of keep it stirred. It's got a little stirrer inside there for, for when you start to... For, before you pour it and stuff like that. Uh, and a little uh, pushy button lid thing. Technical terms. Uh, cost two ninety nine. Sold for nineteen ninety four and made nine fifty after shipping and fees on that one. Tenth of September. Still, this is a uh, Disney store steamboat mini uh, ceramic mug. Uh, always done quite well with Disney mugs. To be honest with you, I'll pay up to a couple of pounds for them. Uh, maybe a little bit more if it's something particularly special or three D or something like that. But generally speaking, a lot of the time you'll pick them up for one to two pounds, and they're generally worth anywhere from sort of. Anywhere from sort of, what, about seven or eight quid up to about 15 to 20, depending on what they are. So they, they can be a, a good little flip if you're just getting started in reselling, or maybe you don't have a lot of money to get started in reselling. They're things that you can pick up relatively cheaply and flip for a reasonable profit to then be able to reinvest into buying more items. So this sold, uh, cost one forty nine, sold for fourteen ninety four, and made seven oh eight after shipping and fees. Also had positive feedback from the buyer on that one, and uh, that sold quite quickly as well. Eleventh of September two thousand nineteen. Uh, whoops, getting ahead of myself there because I'm holding the mouse in my hand and I just clicked it. Let's go back to previous. Eleventh uh, September. This is the JVC GRFX twelve EK camcorder, uh, VHSC, uh, which is the compact VHS cassette style. This was a really nice bundle that I picked up at a car boot for 20 quid. Uh, in there it had the camera, it had two batteries, all of the accessories that come with the camera when it's brand new. It also had a brand new and sealed VHSC tape in there. 
and this little number here is the uh, big VHS tape that you put your VHSC into to watch it on a VCR. So it had kind of the full the full kit and caboodle, really, if you like, with that one. Um, so this cost £20 at a car boot, sold for a total of £103.94 and made £60.17 after shipping and fees. Again, that's down to it being an expensive postage item there. 11th of September again, uh, Ladies Marks and Spencer Wool Blend Coat that you just had a little sneak preview of there. Uh, this is another item that I've had for quite a while, I'm not going to lie. Um, I One of the first items that I bought when I was dipping into high street brands... I started out with clothing, um, very much with the brands that I was aware of. So uh, it was things like Berghaus, North Face, uh, Diesel. Uh, what else did I start out with? Tommy Hilfiger, uh, Helly Hansen, things like that. Brands that I'd been familiar with throughout my life were the things that I started selling in clothing. And they were generally sort of... Um, not necessarily designer brands as such, but kind of slightly better brands and uh, technical brands, outdoor stuff. So that was what I was familiar with. But when I started kind of spreading out from there and I went into, uh, started sort of dipping my toe into high street brands, this was one of the first things that I bought and it was a Marks and Spencer Wool Blend uh, Ladies Overcoat. It was a size 16 petite, so it was, uh, you know, for, for sort of a, a, a shorter, I think, lady, uh, or a, a slightly smaller build lady. Um, cost 9 99 this one. Sold for 54 94 after quite a while, I will be honest. That's probably another one that's been there for around about six to eight months, maybe. Uh, but again, sold eventually. Uh, sold for fifty four ninety four, made thirty two forty seven after shipping and fees on that one. There is a small difference as well between wool blend and wool rich. Uh, wool blend is anything that has uh, more than ten percent wool in it, and wool rich is anything that has anything more than fifty percent wool in it. As is my understanding of these things. So uh, just be careful with your descriptions because if you describe something as wool rich and it's only got sort of ten percent wool in it, I have seen people that have done that on eBay listings before. Um, just be careful with those types of descriptions because they can come back and bite you. 12th of September, uh, Kiko Milano evening bag. This was another one of those kind of brand new items that I picked up at a charity shop. Uh, really only picked it up because it was two quid and it was sparkly and it was getting towards Christmas. So that gives you an idea of how long I've had this item for. Uh, cost two pounds. Sold for twelve ninety four, made six nineteen after shipping and fees. Sat for a while, had it since last Christmas um, and it's only just gone on the 12th. Again, 12th of September. Boys, it's quite a clothing-heavy month this month, actually, isn't it? I've just realised that. So far, anyway, it's been a relatively clothing-heavy month. Uh, 12th of September. Boys, Barber, Lidsdale, Padded Jacket. Barber, again, another one of those outdoor kind of country brands. Uh, started in the UK, but have now kind of got international acclaim. Uh, very popular with uh, sort of the Royals, with with uh, I think the Beckhams are quite into this sort of style as well. Uh, so it, it is becoming a massively well-known brand the world over, and they're very famous for their padded jackets. This was a boys' one, so a, a youth's one. I think it was around about, what does it say there, age 10 to 11 years, so it's a youth's jacket. Um in the blue, classic barber style with the diamond quilt stitch on there. Uh, cost £4, this one, which is an absolute steal for any barber product, whether it's uh, kids or adults. Sold for £39.94 and made £25.27 after shipping and fees on that one. 13th of September, this is another one of my dad's albums that he's asked me to sell. Uh, this is The Free Story. What an album. Some absolutely cracking tunes on there. Some absolute classics. Um, as I've said in previous videos about these records, I've got no aspirations to deal in them full time or to make them any kind of major part of my inventory. But as my family have asked me to sell these, I will more than happily do it for them. Uh, I love the music, but I'm not too bothered about what kind of format it's on. I'm, I'm not a purist in that sense, so they'd kind of be lost on me keeping those things really. Uh, but yeah, that one was free uh, because it was an owned item. It sold for $21.94 and made $14.69 after shipping and fees. 13th of September still, uh, this is uh, S Club 7, S Club Party Live 2001 VHS. Uh, picked up a few VHS videos just lately, uh, just to sort of try them out, a few different things, music performances, uh, kids videos, things like that, just to give them a little go because I picked them up relatively cheap. Uh, always have a VCR to test these things on, definitely. I would never sell a video untested. Uh, not to say that it's the wrong thing to do, you know, if it works for you, then by all means do that. But uh, I'd never sell a video without at least watching five or ten minutes of it, just to make sure 
you know, it, it wasn't sort of trying to track it all the time, or it was, you know, it, these things can degrade over time, and depending on how they've been stored and stuff like that, it can cause them all sorts of problems. So I'll always sort of watch five or ten minutes of a video and make sure it's fully, make sure it's fully rewound as well before I sell it. There's nothing I hate more than seeing um, people with videos listed on eBay, and you go and look at their pictures, and they've not even rewound the cassette. You know, that's to, to me, that's like. It might be a bit of an extreme point of view, but to me, that's just rude. If you're selling a cassette to somebody, a cassette tape or something like that, at least sell it to them so that they can put it into their machine and watch it. They don't have to spend five minutes rewinding it themselves. Again, just a personal uh, sort of take on that one. This one costs 50p, uh, so, you know, cheap enough to have a little gamble on. Uh, sold for 26 uh, Quite a quick sale as well, maybe about a month on that one, which for something that I've not personally sold before, I'm quite happy to wait sort of three or four weeks for a sale on it just to see how it does. Uh, so sold for 26 I made 18 51 after shipping and fees on that one. 14th of September, couple more VHS videos. Uh, this was Shania Twain uh, with a live performance and the platinum collection of music videos. Uh, so this was a total cost of a pound. Uh, they were 50p each. Sold for seventeen ninety four and made ten oh three after shipping and fees. That was another item that went on global shipping to the US. Fourteenth again, uh, the LG DVD VHS combination system. These are always very popular, uh, irrespective of brand. Really, obviously, when you get into some of the higher end brands, they command higher end money. Uh, but really, anything from you know just just sort of some next brand like a, a Deu one or something like that or you know it, it's not necessarily a high-end one but people still want them uh you know people want to be able to transfer vhs tapes to dvds and stuff like that so these systems are always popular uh and also they just save a lot of space if you want to have both options there you've got it both in one unit instead of having two this one cost a fiver uh, it sold for 53.94 made 28.49 after shipping and fees and that one went on the global shipping program to france 15th of september deja vu i've just been in this place before uh this is the sharp pa 3000 electric typewriter sold last month returned because the daisy wheel which is the print head fell out in transit and the previous buyer didn't know how to put it back in uh, I sent the buyer instructions on how to put it back in. I sent the buyer a link to the instruction, to a PDF file of the instruction manual to show them how to put it back in. Uh, I even recorded a video showing how to put the daisy wheel back in this typewriter. Um, but this buyer, the buyer that bought it the first time was absolutely adamant that no, uh, it's damaged in transit. There must be something missing. I want my money back, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, one of those that's just full of indignation. So I just said, yeah, that's fine. You're clearly livid and ill-informed. Send it back. I didn't obviously say that to her, but I thought that in the back of my mind. Um, yeah, so just send it back. So she did. Uh, I refunded that. And then sure enough, a couple of days later, it sold again for the full price because uh, the lady that bought it the first time had actually bought it on a sale price anyway. So I then got it back and sold it for the full price. So, yeah, you know, win some, lose some. Cost six twenty five. This one it was a car boot pickup for a couple of quid, and then it cost me four pound twenty five for a ribbon. Uh, sold for sixty six ninety four. Made thirty three twenty after shipping and fees on that one. Final item I think on this one. This is the sixteenth of September. Uh, again, some diesel jeans. These are ladies groupie jeans. Uh, these cost seven pounds. Sold for thirty seven ninety four and made twenty pounds eighty after shipping and fees. Now I want to say those went on global shipping to Germany, but I've not put the little hickey in. I'm pretty sure they went on global shipping to Germany. I know it's not the end of the world whether you know whether my items have gone on global shipping or not, but I do like to tell you these things just so you kind of get a feel for, you know, if you're starting out, you want to know whether it's worth putting the global shipping program on your eBay store. Uh, I always say that absolutely, yeah, it is because the sales, you know, I'm, I'm selling stuff every month pretty much and it's going abroad. So, you know, I like to tell you where my stuff's gone for that reason. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty sure they did go on global shipping to Germany. I uh, made £20.80 after shipping and fees on those. And I think that was everything items-wise. Yeah, so this is just a little breakdown I've done again for you. Uh, because talking about profits and stuff like that, and the way I present it to you, I think it kind of causes a little bit of confusion sometimes. So the total uh, selling price for all of those items that you've just seen on that video, uh, that was 864 46 as a total. 
The total cost of those items was 111.18, and the total profit made was uh, 547. Now, if we total up all of the deductions, that's what this bit is here underneath. Um, total eBay fees. Uh, so this, the total eBay fees that includes the final value fee, the final value fee on any postage charged. It includes any promoted listing fees. We then add the PayPal fees to that, the total paid out in postage, and the total cost of the items. So if you take this 864.46, add up all of the outgoings that are associated with that, it comes to 359.99. And that gives you a total profit of 504.47 for the first half of September. So hopefully that makes life a little bit more easy in terms of understanding uh, how I'm showing my profit to you. So that is everything for the first part of uh, September's sales roundup. Uh, part two will be up in the next couple of days because it's not really far off. Oh, it's the 19th, isn't it? Um, it's not far off the end of the month, so I'll be back in a few days with part two of September's sales roundup. Uh, but in the meantime, guys, if you enjoyed the video, please do feel free to leave me a like. If you didn't enjoy the video, please feel free to leave a dislike. But don't just thumb and run either way. Do let me know what you did like and what you didn't like, and I'll try and tailor my future videos accordingly and do more of the stuff you do like and less of the stuff you don't like. Do feel free to leave any comments down below, and if you enjoy the channel, do feel free to subscribe. Uh, do also then give the bell a little tickle in the top corner there, and that'll notify you whenever I upload a new video. But otherwise, guys, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for spending this time with me, and have a great day. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.